esta es la primera conferencia que tenemos de este estupendo seminario de traducción y traductología. Los que vieron las, eh, las noticias eh, que compartimos y la información que compartimos, esto es absolutamente de nuevo cuño. ¿Por qué partimos con, con esta serie de conferencias a lo largo del año, siendo esta la primera y terminamos en noviembre? porque justamente no tenemos un espacio con estas características y tan consolidado en la Universidad de Chile, eh, y lo necesitamos, lo necesitamos urgente, necesitamos urgente eh, tener conocimientos, tener diálogo, tener una suerte de, de introducción de, de una serie de, de modos y de maneras de, de, de conocer, eh, de aprender y de reflexionar en torno a la traducción y a la traductología. So, Valentina, probably it will be the most scientific um, conference in all the series of this seminar. So I'd like to start with that, and probably all of us, we don't know, we, we don't know in fact, this topic, this is a special topic, because it's completely new too, completely new. Uh, it's work in process, and Valentina will give us an uh, introduction about this new type, this new process, about second languages, about um, translation, traduction, in subtitles. So, Valentina, the time Thank is you. all for you. Thank Valentina you will much. give us probably about 45 minutes, probably. Yes, yes, yes 45 up, yeah. minutes. Might be 40 if I speak too fast, but I will try to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, we'll have a dialogue with, with her. Yes. Okay, welcome, my dear. Thank you very much. So I will uh, share my screen, which will stop the sharing of your presentation. Let me see if I can uh, do that. Can everyone see my slides? So we tried this a second ago, and it was a little bit slow to uh, to load. But can you see the presentation without oh, yes. um, without any sort of? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, we perfect. Can. So let me just look at, get myself up there. Okay, perfect. So, well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, if you uh, if you are in Chile. Thank you very much for the invitation. I uh, consider it a really a pleasure to be here today and to start off this series of very engaging uh, seminars. Uh, with my talk, and I hope that you will enjoy the content of this presentation. Before starting, I would also like to thank personally two people that are quite special uh, to me and instrumental to this uh, to this happening. The first is uh, Dr. Alejandra Ortiz, because she invited me in the first place and she put me in contact with uh, the second person that I would like to thank, Dr. Soledad uh, chavez Faya, who organized and coordinated and will continue to coordinate this series as, as we keep going until uh, until November. So what a great effort and uh, thank you for having me. That's, uh, that's all. Now, when I was discussing with Soledad this presentation, we were saying kind of exactly what, what, what Soledad said, right? I, it, was, it was my understanding that, that both audiovisual translation as a field and uh, uh, eye tracking as a methodology uh, are relatively new and underexplored, perhaps not just in your institution, but also in the whole uh, of Chile. So, um, so for this reason, my talk will be introductory in nature. So without further ado, the plan for today is first of all, to provide an overview of the basic concepts uh, and the rationale behind doing this type of research. So we will look at what it is, what audiovisual translation actually is, and, um, and why is important or valuable to do uh, to look at the processing and at the reception of uh, audiovisual material. Then I will sort of plunge a little bit deeper into the world of eye tracking and I will consider eye movements, at least the basic ones, and then um, a lot of the metrics that can be extracted from these eye movements. Uh, we will yeah. also look together at uh, some of the incredible number, uh, incredibly frequent applications um, of, uh, uh, of eye tracking uh, in a number of fields. And then we will look at uh, uh, reading patterns when we watch images and when we read text uh, primarily, right? Because I, that's what I'm interested in, in looking at how we read subtitles, so film translation, but not only. 
um, uh, and how this can contribute to various things, for example, like language learning. And then um, at that point, I will introduce the Audiovisual Translation Lab, which is the place I, I work uh, for uh, at the University of Warsaw in Poland. And, um, and finally, we will look at some at how using eye tracking technology can help us investigate subtitle reading by looking at specific at one specific example. OK, so first of all, what is audiovisual translation? Um, we could say that this is a translation of multimedia texts, right? So these texts aren't just verbal um, texts. Uh, they are part of a larger whole. What does this mean? That there is additional information there that this text needs to take into account and the translation also uh, needs to take into account. And this is supplied by a system of signs other than linguistic ones. So alongside text, we may have pictures, we may have music, we may have gestures, we may have facial expressions, proximity, um, scenery built up on stage, for example, in the, in the theater, or slides in a presentation like this one, right? So audiovisual translation is broader than just translating films or, or, or documentaries, okay? We, we talk about audiovisual translation as a translation of song lyrics, or YouTube videos, or a TED talk, or the news, which are particularly interesting because they have lots of other texts generally appearing at the bottom of the screen, right? Or um, slideshow or lecture slides, for example, in university context, that could also be, if you were to translate that, that would count as audiovisual translation. Um, and also other things like um, exhibitions in museum, which increasingly tend to be multimodal in, in nature and including digital media. So that would also count as a judicial translation. Opera translation, uh, theater captioning, uh, as well as audio description for the blind, the part of hearing, all of this is audiovisual translation. Now, now that we have this clear, we move on to another question, which is why you may ask, should we begin even to investigate the reception of audiovisual material? Um, well, first of all, there are many reasons. The first one is that more and more video content is being consumed at present, right? Especially digital since the advent of the digital age. Not just that, but also more and more videos are being not just consumed, but also produced, right? More than ever before. Let's think for example of, uh, uh, of uh, social media like Facebook or, or, or other uh, sites like YouTube where people can upload uh, videos or blogs, which can have a mixture of words and images, pictures and, and, and video as well, right? Um, so this bears the question of, you know, bring or brings the need, if you like, to understand how people relate to this kind of, of content, right? And, and, there, and looking at processing is part of this understanding. Importantly, VOD services as well, so video on demand services, like for example, Netflix, uh, HBO or Amazon Prime have grown enormously in popularity, especially since the pandemic. And I think we all agree on that, whichever side of the world we, we live in. And as a key important uh, um, element for us, they are raising subtitle speeds steadily. Now, to give you an example, in Europe, at least up until recently, so before Netflix became a thing, we had... Um, we had a reading speed or subtitle speed, so the presentation rate at which the subtitles appear and disappear on a video, uh, which was around 12 to 15 characters per second, CPS. This is a measure of, 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 of speed. Um, since Netflix came along, they pushed this quite high, so up to 17 for the foreign um, audience, which, uh, which may not speak English as a foreign language, and for their home market, they push it even further up to 20 characters per second. So, you know, this bears the question, how fast is too fast? You know, how fast before even our viewers or Netflix viewers cannot even follow what is going on on the screen, right? So there is a sort of direct relevance of, of doing this, uh, this type of research as well. We also know that we extract meaning from the visuals more quickly than we do from the written language. So it's interesting to see the moment we have a film and we add the written code in the form of subtitles, you know, how does this affect uh, not just the processing, but also the enjoyment, for example, or the understanding, the comprehension of, of these audiovisual texts and products, right? Um, there are also creative practices in audiovisual translation, fan subbing is one of them. So it's basically subtitles created by fans, so not by professionals. And they are um, 
generally very creative, right? They don't follow the rules. The subtitle doesn't appear in the middle of the screen, at the bottom of the screen. They appear all over, at the top, at the bottom, horizontal, vertical. They have different colors. They have different sizes. That's what I mean by creative practices. And this can have disruptive. So we were talking about these creative practices and how they can disrupt uh, attention distribution potentially. So that's another reason why it would be interesting to look at the reception of audiovisual material. And last, uh, by but by no means least, let's see if I can, yeah. Uh, there could be uh, reading strategies, uh, um, specific reading strategies that uh, viewers put into play to cope with this um, many, uh, this uh, high number of, of elements that are there to be processed in the film, or for example, to cope with uh, increasing reading speeds, as we've just said, right? So, uh, and these reading strategies could perhaps be taught, but obviously, be, so in, and this could be helpful in, for example, dealing with things like uh, attention deficit disorders, right? So on, on the medical side, even, I mean, it's a bit of a step, but the, the first step would be to understand what these reading patterns are, and that's what this kind of research uh, can do. And then the third question would be, why eye tracking? You know, why looking at reception by, by eye tracking? Well, the assumption here is that eye tracking gives us a window into the mind, right? Thanks to the eyes. So this is not always, I'd like to point out, not always the case, like the eyes can be decoupled from our attention, uh, but most often if we are looking at something, that's also where we are paying attention to. So there is this assumption. It's important to realize that it is an assumption. It is not always satisfied, but most of the time it is. And, and this is very powerful because then with this eye tracking technology, what we can do is we can in a more natural way observe reading patterns without having the need for this secondary task. And may I just ask if you can see the cursor? Can you see my mouse as I move the mouse on the slides? Perfect. Yes. Yes. Okay, so we, without the need for these secondary tasks, right? For example, before eye tracking, we would have to I ask people to vocalize their thought processes, which intrinsically interferes with the thought process because we are vocalizing it at the same time that you are thinking about it. And also, you know, you are making it explicit to, to, to the person that you're talking to. So uh, the really, really one of the many reasons why this technology is really valuable uh, uh, and valued as well is that it's, um, it's a more natural way of looking at reading processes. It, it's non-intrusive and non-disruptive, right? And then on top of that, it also provides very rich moment-by-moment -moment data um, sources of data. Uh, let me just say what it means, what this means in, in, in a couple of words. In, uh, in uh, Warsaw, at the audiovisual translation lab where I work now, we have recently bought an eye tracker that it's called the 1000 plus, right? And what this 1000 uh, stands for is the frequency or sampling rate. So how many times, how many, every how many milliseconds the eye tracker tries to sample the position of the eye on the screen, for example. And this particular eye tracker samples the eye position every millisecond, which then results in a thousand samples every second. In terms of data points, you know, you can, you know, if you are used to working with Excel files, for example, you can just imagine how big the data sets are, right? Which has some challenges, but it also means that the data is very rich and there are some really fine grained um, hypotheses that can be tested on this data. And a proof of the pudding, if you like, is that um, in the eye tracking is applied in a flurry of fields. Uh, there, I mean, there is really, I, I, I'm listing some here, psychology, psycholinguistics, second language acquisition and reading research. And although, uh, you know, I'm technically from translation studies, these are the areas where, with which I overlap uh, um, on, on my daily sort of uh, work, with my daily work, but also neuroscience, engineering, in the automotive field. So sometimes people can wear these eye tracking glasses. We don't work with the glasses because they have a high, lower precision. We invite people in the lab for high precision, but you know, if you wear these glasses and they use them on, for example, truck drivers, uh, when they drive for a lot, a lot of hours, if they risk, you know, they run the risk of falling asleep. And what this means is that your uh, eyelid will close, right? And if the eye tracker, if you're wearing these glasses and the eye tracker can, can recognize this from happening, perhaps fatal accidents can be averted, can be avoided, okay? So there's so many applications in medicine to look at ADHD, but not only that, a number of neurological disorders can be investigated 
um, website testing, usability studies, marketing, architecture, design, you name it, gaming, very popular, human-computer interaction, broadly speaking, and finally, translational studies as well, obviously, right? So these applications, in this application of eye tracking in, in, in a variety of fields is matched, on the other hand, by the proliferation of manufacturers that exist. Right, so I even had to take some of the slides because there were too many, I couldn't fit them. So here I'm not going to sort of say much about them. I just wanted to show you the sheer number. What I will say is this is what we use. Um, I wouldn't recommend uh, uh, using this as, as first timer. So if you're considering as a department buying an eye tracker, I wouldn't buy this because you know it, it requires being familiar with a bit of programming. There's the, the, the learning curve is very steep, even for someone that has already used eye tracking. But um, other leading manufacturers like SMI and like Toby are pretty good for entry level, and they still allow you to, you know, if you if you pick a frequency of the eye tracker that is quite high, not necessarily 1,000 samples, but 350, for example, of 250. The Toby um, the Toby uses in my PhD, I use the 160. Maybe these numbers don't mean much to you, but, but you can tell that 160 is a lot lower than 1000 right in terms of so um so these are quite good for entry levels and then iMotion is also the fourth key uh leading manufacturer and with this particular system you can integrate eye tracking with other uh applications like EEG um and um, galvanic skin response or heart rate so you can you can mix and match a number of methods to investigate uh behavior and cognition for example um so we talked about eye tracking. Eye tracking is, you know, the ability, the capability of tracking where the eyes are moving, right? But what kind of eye movements uh, does this involve? There are two main types. The first is fixations. When we read, when we process an image, anything that we look at, we process via fixations, which are pauses, basically, right? They are per periods of relative stability of the eye, uh, on a specific area of the visual field, could be a text, could be an image, Typically, which means on average, they last for 200, 250 milliseconds in humans. However, please note that the range is much wider. So just because the average is 200 and 250 doesn't mean, you know, actually fixations of 500 milliseconds are quite common. But, but on a, if we are, take the average, this is, uh, this is what the fixation duration is. And we always look at fixation durations in milliseconds, right? Hence also the frequency of the eye tracker is in, in, uh, in milliseconds. Now, the other movements are saccades. The saccades are, are not these periods of relative stability, but are jumps in between these, these, these pauses, right? Uh, and so, and these are also uh, the other key um, uh, eye movement that, that is looked at in, uh, in eye tracking research. I would add to all of that regressions, which if at least in languages like, uh, like European languages, when we read from left to right, right? So we proceed in this particular fashion, regression would be the opposite movement to that. So moving from right, left to right. Typically, I would understand regressions to be saccades, so that the types of jumps. So you go from this point here to backwards, and it is the jump, but you can refer to that as a, as a regressive saccade. And also the resulting fixation can be called a, a regression, right? Or a regressive fixation. So now that we've said this, so two, basically, plus maybe three main eye movements. Uh, now, this slide I don't want to spend too much time on. I, it's just here for you in case you are interested. I will share my presentation so you have some extra context here. What I would like to instead to concentrate on is the next slide where we look at metrics. So from these two main fixation, main um, eye movements, we can extract a lot of metrics, a lot of measures that are used in different fields, right? We saw how many fields eye tracking is applied to. The challenge is often understanding and finding what are the main metrics that are applied to your field and what they are representing, right? So we can count the fixations, for example fixation number or count. We can look at individual fixation durations. So, um, and here I'd like to point out, for example, I, I hope that you can see the numbers inside these, um, these fixations. This is number one, and then this is number two. Now you can see number one is, is a bigger circle. This is because the, the diameter of, this, uh, of these circles is directly proportional to the duration. So the, the larger the diameter, the, larger the, the longer the fixation. So this fixation is longer, number one, than number two, right? Um, if we then count all of the durations together, 
on a particular area of interest. So let's say that we are interested in this, uh, this girl's face and then in the boy's face. So we could count all of these fixations that fall inside our area of interest and we would get dwell time, so total time. Then we could also take this time divided by the, the number of fixations. So we take all this duration and then we count how many fixations there are. We divide the two and we get an average, right? So mean fixation duration. This measure is particularly important in number of fields, psycholinguistics, second language research, and as it indicates cognitive processing. And the more, well, the longer the mean fixation duration, the higher supposedly the cognitive processing. This doesn't mean that something is necessarily difficult, but it, it can. So when there is... So, for example, syntactic or, or semantic ambiguity, then mean fixation duration tends to be longer. It could also, however, be because a target is particularly interesting and therefore someone who is drawn to fixate on it for longer. So it doesn't have to be necessarily um, difficulty, depending on, on what field you are, you are considering, but it's a very important measure. Another one is first fixation duration, right? So, for example, here, this is the very, fix the very first fixation that the participant makes on this whole scene, on this whole image. And less so when we're looking at images, but when we're looking at words, first fixation duration is important because that indicates the first time that our eyes fall on a particular word, right? And that's when lexical information is extracted, which is the first step to then understand the words and then stringing the words together and understanding the sentence later. So in, in psychology and psycholinguistics, it has particular value. Time to first fixation also has. For example, in some paradigms, they may show some targets appearing on the screen, and then they are interested in looking at in how long it takes to the participant to go there with their eyes, right? So the time it takes before the first fixation. And this, so these uh, are just to do with fixations, right? We said the fixations is one type of eye movements. Look at how many metrics can be extracted. And this is very few. I can assure you there are more, but then we could have just a presentation about the metrics. So I had to choose some. So these are the sort of more relevant for me uh, and for other uh, fields. So as far as the saccade are concerned, we have saccade length. So the saccade is this jump here, right? This, this line. And uh, it's generally measured in, in degrees of the visual angle. Uh, and it's, uh, it can also be called amplitude, not just length, but they are the same thing. Then we can also look at crossovers. So the number of shifts, right? The saccadic movements. So if we said, for example, that we're interested in the, in the girl's face and then in the boy's face, if we go from one to two here, this would not be a crossover because we are staying inside this area of interest. But if we go from two to three, which is hidden somewhere here, this would be crossover number one. And you can, we can count the amount of times that one person goes from one area to the next, right? Um, and this is, for example, useful in translation studies when we have parallel texts and we look at revision practices or, or, or translation practices and we want to look at how the translators process the two texts, the one that they are writing and the one that they are translating from. And then proportional reading time, this is also very important, especially in subtitle research, we have, um, so what it means is that we have a subtitle, right? The subtitle stays on screen for a number of seconds, let's say six seconds. Within these six seconds, how much time do the, trans, do the people, the viewers spend reading the subtitle versus processing the images, proportional in the sense that it's proportional to the duration of each subtitle, right? So for us, this is quite a, quite a common measure. And then skipping rates. Um, if, for example, we are interested only in the ear of the girl, not her whole face, then we see zero fixations here. So this would have a skipping of one. Skipping is generally a binary variable, skipped or not skipped. If it's skipped, it's a one. If it's not skipped, it's a zero. Sort of, you can assign these values, right? And with words, more importantly, and I can show you in the next slide, um, our reading patterns don't generally fall on, our reading doesn't fall on every word, right? We, there are lots of words that we skip. So here, for example, the word his and the word the don't have any of these dots, don't have any of these fixations, right? So they are effectively skipped. Um, here, I would just like to show you, you know, reiterate, these are fixations, uh, smaller, so uh, shorter and longer, this one. We can number them, and by numbering them, then we are able to identify what counts as a regression. This is a regressive saccade, and this is a regressive fixation. And then, of course, as I said, some of the words are skipped. They generally are function words, like um, articles, like prepositions, like um, possessives, you know, who are very short and very frequent. We'll revisit that later. And then the last thing I wanted to mention here is 
areas of interest or interest areas, which, what are these? This is a terminology that you will hear a lot when you talk about eye tracking. Well, in order to look at where these fixations fall, we need to create some areas that we are interested in. And so when it comes to reading, at least these, to all intents and purposes, are boxes, right? Boxes that we draw around each word of the subtitle. Now, when you import a text with no video and no subtitles, just a Word document, for example, most eye tracking software is able to automatically import the text and segment it. So divide by using the space between the words is able to automatically create areas of interest. Unfortunately, when until very recently, when it came to subtitling, this was not possible because what I had to do, for example, in my PhD was burn the subtitles onto the clip. Right, so we, they're not two separate files like like uh, you may find in in, in your uh, AVI player, and you play both at the same time, and you put them in the same folder. They are one file only. The subtitles are burnt into the image; they become part of the image, and then this automatic drawing of the interest areas is no longer possible. So typically, so far, we had situation like this, right? So we had global manually drawn interest area around the video and manually drawn interest area around the subtitles, right? Which is less precise because then, you know, we can count the number of subtitles, the number of fixations and all of those metrics here, but in one area of interest, not per word. Recently, however, and this is really exciting uh, for me, we are finally, especially with the manufacturer that we are working on, we have been able to reach this. And this is a breakthrough because, you know, as you can see, the areas of interest are exactly the same. They are automatically generated. They are correctly segmenting. They don't have, I don't know if you can see here what I'm pointing, you know, these slight inaccuracies that are due to my manual drawing, you know? I mean, you, you, you can, there are ways of making this, this exactly the same, but I've left it to, to show you, you know, the, the, how approximate this is compared to something like this. And it would be simply impossible for us to manually draw areas of interest and how many subtitles are there in a 10 minute clip, you know, and, and, and how many words within this subtitle. So it, it was prohibitive until now, but now finally we can look at word level analysis. And this is a breakthrough because it means that any question that we've asked so far in reading research, in second language acquisition by reading, for example, text, we can now ask in multimodal situations. So exciting times, uh, as far as I'm concerned, obviously I'm biased. Now, that said, the first question that arises is now that we can actually test this is, well, is reading subtitles the same as reading a normal printed text or not? Now, because we looked at a typical reading pattern of a normal sentence, here is a typical reading pattern uh, in a subtitle uh, and within a multimodal text situation. So we generally start from the center, we go down, we process the written text in the subtitles with longer fixations, shorter fixations, perhaps sometimes with regressions. We read the first line and the second line, and then in, in a more or, or less regular way. And then if there is time, this is crucial, we go back to the image, right? This is. This is sort of what happens. And uh, since now we're going to look at, um, at uh, uh, more subtitling-based uh, uh, research, specifically, I thought that this would be a nice uh, time and point in the presentation to introduce the lab that I work for. It's called the Audiovisual Translation Lab. I am particularly interested in subtitling, but that's not the only thing that we look at. As we saw earlier, audiovisual translation is an umbrella term right, is a constellation of different practices to do with multimedia and uh, dubbing and, uh, and voiceover are also um, some of them. And we, we, we deal with this kind of translation in the AVT lab. And also interestingly, uh, in the past, at least, they have done some media accessibility work, quite a lot of it. So they looked at audio description for the blind, for example. Uh, they designed, this might be quite interesting, we were talking about museum earlier, uh, museums earlier, they designed an app uh, that provides audio description. So a, a blind or partially blind person can go to Museum Narodowe, which is the national museum here in Warsaw, and can on their phone, so you don't even need a headset or anything, you can download the app and certain uh, works have been marked and you can download the, well, yeah, not download, you can, through the app, you can play a description of what of what uh, normally able people would be able to, to, to look at with their eyes, right? Which is, Really nice. Um, so audio description is, is, is part of this, but also subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing, which, which differs in quite substantial uh, way from subtitling for hearing uh, audiences. All right, so this is some of the work that we do. This is some of the people. You can see myself there. I tend to work with the, with the people uh, on the first row there, namely with uh, Sonia Skriba, who is a PhD student. 
and with Professor Agnieszka Sharkowska, who is the head of the lab. Uh, this is us in the lab. Um, as you can see, Agnieszka is not quite strapped, but he's keeping her, her chin and her forehead against this contraption that is called a chin rest. And what we use this for is, is minimizing data loss and, uh, and data quality degradation by, by minimizing the head movement um, of the participants. Because if we move our heads too far back and forward or too sideways, the eye tracker might lose our eyes, right? Because we're not wearing the glasses. The eye tracker, you cannot see it. It's in between uh, the screen and the, um, and the monitor. And this is what it looks like. This is the beast. And then, so this is the display PC, as it's called. So where you show the film to the participant. And this is, we call it the host PC, where the experimenter sits and monitors that everything is proceeding correctly. This is a view of this, um, of this host PC, uh, where you do calibration, right? So these circles here, I hope that you can see them, they're a bit faint, but uh, this is where the participants would sit. So then you would uh, <coughs> you would try to sort of get their eyes seen. This is where the pupils would, would appear. And this is where you perform what is called calibration and validation. So these are procedures that you need to uh, work through in order before you test each participant and before uh, showing the stimuli. And this is the eye tracker uh, right there. So you can see, this is a real picture from our lab taken a few weeks ago. And this is me sat down at the experimenter uh, host PC. You can see with this, this is a participant watching the video and you can see pictures of the eye, and you have lots of information. P stands for uh, pupil uh, size. We have corneal reflection. We have you know, which trial in the experiment is, is, uh, is, is taking place, et cetera. We have a picture of the left eye and right eye because we are collecting data binocularly in this particular case. Um, so just, just to show you a little bit what in practice it means to work in these labs, they're generally very small and they don't have windows. Um, so just in case you're, you know, you're thinking of embarking in this, be, be aware of that. And I mean, so now that I've given you some, some information about our lab, what have we found? I mean, actually, I have to say this slide is not just us. This is community knowledge that we have acquired via a lot of labs like our own all around the world. So I don't want to take credit for all of this, but we can say that eye movements in uh, subtitle and audiovisual um, material processing are affected by many variables. Some of them belong to the text characteristics, right? To the audiovisual text uh, realm. So they include uh, subtitle speed, right? We mentioned this earlier. Subtitle segmentation also, right? Where do you segment? So if you have a subtitle that is two lines long, where do you break it? So if you don't have syntactically logic uh, breaks, this affects eye movements. So what do I mean by syntactic um, breaks and logical breaks. So for example, we would keep the noun phrase together. You wouldn't say a dog, you would say a dog. And then you put a dog either on the first line or the second line, you don't split them. Or, uh, uh, or you know, prepositional phrases to the cinema. You don't, you wouldn't have to the cinema or to the cinema. You would try to put to the cinema as a prepositional phrase all on the same line, this kind of things. Then the presence of video and sound, also very important. This is not very ecologically valid, but uh, it's a study that uh, uh, some um, researchers have run in Australia and we are trying to replicate this. And I'll show you uh, more about this in a second. We have video, we manipulate the video. We take it off and we put it on. So when we take it off to all intents and purposes, you only have the subtitles. There are no moving images, right? And what that allows us to do, although it's very ecologically invalid, because very rarely we will not we will watch a film without, without the moving images. But what that allows us to do is isolate the contribution of adding video versus not adding video, right? So, um, uh, and then in autumn, we will do the same with sound. Now, currently, we're working on this study. Uh, then we've already mentioned this earlier, words that are frequent tend to be skipped, right? And words that are rare, so they don't occur that much in the language, you can be fairly sure that they will receive some fixations at least. Similarly, this is one of the strongest effects that in psycholinguistic and, 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 and reading studies in general, reading research has, 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 has achieved, and it's a very stable effect. Uh, so everything else kept equal, frequent words tend to get skipped. They don't have to, but they tend to get skipped. Similarly with Lent, if a word is particularly long, like I don't know, extraterrestrial with lots of syllables, then you can be again sure that 
it will receive a list of things affixation, right? If a word is very short, on the other hand, like those function words that we encountered earlier, then it's more likely to be skipped. And then part of speech, of course, whether we are considering verbs, adjective, adverbs, this can also influence eye movements, right? Not only these sort of more textual and subtitle um, characteristics, however, are liable to affect eye movements, but also more video base, like the genre of the video or the language of the video. And on top of all of this, the counterpart is viewer characteristics, right? Eye movements belong to humans. We are watching the video. So characteristics of the people processing these type of texts also have an impact. Language proficiency, my favorite, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, has uh, an impact, working memory. So not just short-term memory and long-term memory, but this more active ability to, um, to process, to keep active in, in, in the mind uh, informations, be it numbers or words. For example, when you um, when someone tells you a phone number, you don't have anything to write it down, so you try to repeat it to yourself to keep it active in your mind until you reach the phone where you can type it, right? And then it's forgotten, it's gone forever. But that ability to not just plainly remember, but keep the information active in the mind, working memory. So if people who have a high working memory, they tend to have a different uh, eye movement patterns that, um, or they can have a different uh, move, um, eye movement pattern, or at least they can for example, they can achieve comprehension in a different in a different way. For example, better comprehension, perhaps, or memory, of course. Type of, so if you ask people to try and remember certain words that occur in the subtitles, if you have a, an unusually high working memory, you generally need to be excluded from from uh, from the study because you will skew the data. It's like you're not. It's not normal. It's not how, how most people uh, behave, or particularly low, or particularly high age. Of course, as we know that there is cognitive decline. So if we test a sixty-year-old or seventy-year-old, it's much different from if we test a twenty-year-old. Literacy, and there is some really interesting work here going on um, by a, a researcher called Kotari in India. So he worked with. Uh, with Hindi and maybe Gujarati, but not, don't quote me on the Gujarati, but at least Hindi, uh, with Bollywood films. And um, so to try and teach. So a lot of people are illiterate in, in India. They don't necessarily have access to, to mainstream education. And, um, and actually subtitles can be used there as well. And using eye tracking can help us identify, really pinpoint why and in which ways the using subtitle video can be useful for this. And then of course, hearing status, right? If someone is completely deaf from birth, their eye movements will be different from, um, from a hearing participant. So these are the some of the, uh, uh, some, not all, uh, of the reasons why, uh, uh, of the variables that can affect eye movement and, and reading patterns, right? Now, I would like to concentrate for uh, a little longer on uh, subtitle speed and video presence, right? Which are two of these characteristics. So I'd like to, just talk about this study that we run, um, in particular, this paper that we are replicating um, from Liao, so where the authors tested native English speakers who were not accustomed to subtitling, and they manipulated subtitle speed, three speeds, 12, which we said earlier is, is kind of okay, 20 is pretty fast, and then 28, which is incredibly fast. And then they also manipulate video absence, like in A here, so literally, subtitles against the back, black background and video presence with the moving images, right? So they showed to their participants, which were quite young, between 18 and 36, a com various combinations of these, um, of these uh, videos without the video at, at a different speed. There was no sound also to prevent for the influence of sound. And let's see what they found. I'm mentioning this study because we said that the speed is, is rather important earlier and also because this is what we are replicating. However, whilst they did it with English speakers, English native speakers, we're doing it with Polish native speakers for whom, therefore, these English subtitles will be in the foreign language. Okay. So what did they find? Well, they found a lot. And I think I'm just looking at the time now because we had a bit of um, a bit of the delay. We might not have an awful lot of time. So instead of looking at all of these graphs, I'm just going to look at, um, at this, a number of fixations. But here in these four panels, we have number of fixation. We have average fixation durations. We have average saccade length. So the length of these jumps and then the numbers of crossover, right? Between the subtitle area and the video area. So these are all things that we've, talked be about before. This comes from a published paper. So this you can see this in practice, how uh, you know, it features in, in publications as well. And um, just looking at this particular graph, we can see that um, so the black line represents the subtitles. 
area, right? So this is a global area of interest around the subtitle versus global area of interest around the video. So, and this is regardless of whether the video was present or not, right? People tend to make, because these two lines, which both represents the subtitle area, when there is video displayed and when there is no video displayed, doesn't matter, fixation numbers on the subtitle area are higher than on the video area, okay? Um, it would be interesting to look at this, but I don't know if we have time. Do you think I had, we have time or? Go ahead. Have... Yes, okay. go ahead. Okay, <laughs> no problem. okay I will. Because, because the, it, what is interesting here is that, you know, okay, here it seems that subtitles just, just attract more attention, right? But number of fixation tells us literally absolutely nothing about the duration of this, these fixations, right? We can make lots of very tiny, very fast duration fixations. But if you then look at the duration and one way of doing that of including it in the count is by looking at the average right then look the situation changes quite a bit uh, right so if we look at the solid lines first so these this darker one and this and this gray one so the solid lines represents the absence of video okay and the black one is the subtitle so in the absence of video again the same thing applies Fixations are on average longer on the subtitles. Why? Well, because of course, there is nothing interesting to look at here. So of course my fixation durations are going to be, you know, um, uh, longer here. However, the moment we add the video, so there are the moving images to look at. And so in this case, we're looking at the dotted line. Look, the situation is inverted. The, dark, the darker um, dotted line is the subtitles and the lighter dotted line is the video region, right? Look what happens at 12 characters, per, and these are the three speeds. Sorry, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, right? So these dots are all at 12, this is all at 20, and this is all at 28. So look at how far away, how much higher on the, on the y-axis. The, the, we said that the fixation duration on average is between 20 and 20 and 250, sorry, 200 and 250. So we are up here for video, fixations on video, yes? Yeah? And this is fixations on the subtitles. So at 12 characters per second, so in the normal viewing condition, the people don't just read the subtitle. So what was argued in the past, you know, okay, well, when the subtitle appear, subtitles appear, people forget about the images and just look at the subtitle. Not true. And this shows it very well. In fact, mean fixation duration is higher. However, the moment we increase speed, this distance decreases. Look, it is much smaller here and even smaller here at 28. What does this mean? It means that when speed increases, even with the presence of the video, the difference in average, in mean fixation duration between the video region and the subtitle region diminishes up to the point that it's almost the same, right? What does this mean? That when the subtitles are fast, in fact, too fast, people have to prioritize subtitle reading. So the distribution of attention changes because they can't barely get to the end. And I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but talking about this change of strategy um, is necessary because, and having this change of strategy is necessary in order to try and reach the end, right? If I jump to the video and then I'm up there, it's going to take me longer to go down and read. And by the time I start reading, the subtitle might have disappeared. And so this is my last slide before the conclusions. This is when I wanted to ask you to do this short exercise. This is a video at our highest speed. I will play it and explain a few things. Whilst I do this, could you please look at the end of the subtitles, the last word, and sometimes even the second last word, and um, check if they are always processed or not, right? Are there any fixations? So as you do this, I will explain a little bit more what are all these squiggles that move on screen. Um, so we have two dots, red, uh, well, pink is the, red, uh, the right eye and the green is the left eye because we collected data binocularly. This is an aggregate view. So there are more than one participant together. And uh, it's obviously the fastest speed. Look, it's just about to happen there, yes. And the fact that we see these trails are, um, are indicative of the saccade. So you can, when you display and then record these clips with the eye tracking data on, uh, you can decide to show the saccades as well. And that's what happens here, right? So look at how really close together these eye movements are. Like it looks like people are looking exactly in the same places, you know? And importantly, look, it just happened there as well. It doesn't really, and this is generally the point at which people start stop listening to me and just marvel how, how lovely the penguins are. So I will be stopping this video soon. But from the subtitles that you have seen so far, I hope that, well, let's see, maybe this one is, yeah, in this case, they did reach the end. In this case, also they reached the end. 
but not in this case. The word C was not read, right? So I just uh, I just wanted to uh, to mention this because this is raw data that we collected on our language learners. It's not been processed. It's not, it's not been cleaned. It's literally just a recording. We haven't analyzed the data yet, but you can already see that at 28 characters per second is just too fast. People do not manage to reach the end of the sentence. And because there is no audio and there are comprehension questions afterwards, the subtitle and then the sum information that you have in the images is the only way to understand what is going on. Uh, originally, this is David Attenborough, a famous uh, documentary presenter in the UK. This is a BBC series, doc documentary series, but the audio is not there. So the subtitles are really important and need to be relied on. Uh, and in the situation with native language speakers, we found that they skipped some of the words at the end. This is already visible for language learners as well. So I will conclude here because we're getting out of time. So what are the sort of take home messages uh, here? Number one, subtitle processing has started to be investigated at the word level very recently, and this is very exciting. So there are lots of possibilities if anyone is interested in getting into this area of translation studies. Also, eye tracking is a very powerful tool, as we I hope I have shown to some extent, that allows to investigate the mental processes that go on in, in the brain, in the mind, non-intrusively. And it produces, it provides a, a lot of data and potentially quite fine-grained data, especially now that we can look at word level. Using this methodology is leading to exciting new insights in audiovisual translation specifically. This is what I can comment on, for example, about the role that is played by subtitle speed, as we have seen. However, this technology can be used in any areas of linguistics and translation, and as we've seen, beyond, right? So I took the liberty of looking a little bit at the other presentations that will occur, right? In the rest, in the rest of the series. And I just looked at how, you know, there will be people looking at corpora, for example, and eye tracking could be easily uh, applied there, right? You could look at how people process this parallel series of, of, of texts, right? Um, and, and see how many crossovers there are or how people try to extract information from corpora and what they look for. Um, Alejandra will be presenting about some texts uh, which, um, from the title of her presentation, have some non-standard spelling. Um, so, for example, the lightful spelled with two L's or pity spelled with two T's. Now, we know that creating this sort of, um, if we accidentally or, or, or if we intentionally insert a spelling mistake, this can also trigger higher regressions, for example. So people can read and then they go back because there's something that catches their attention, right? So this is also potentially investigatable via eye tracking uh, technology. Um, someone else will, will also be looking at, um, at different textual genres, uh, in particular philosophical texts. Now, philosophical texts tend to be quite complex, right? Syntactically complex and also conceptually complex. It's not as easy as, you know, your, your shopping list that you use to go to the supermarket. And this syntactic complexity and lexical complexity can certainly be investigated using eye tracking, right? So it depends on what research questions you want to ask, but it's very possible in conclusion that, um, and I want to make just, just the last example, that someone else will be looking at terminological competence and how this affects translation of medical texts. This is also a perfect example, right? I expect that terminological com competence not only can be said to have an effect on the translation of medical text from a sort of purely reasoning point of view. Uh, it can be argued that this is important, but it can also be seen physiologically by looking at the eye movements, how perhaps people who have this knowledge, who know the, te the technical terminology uh, in the medical jargon, uh, will have a different eye pattern or, or will have perhaps shorter mean fixation duration because they won't have to be to concentrate so much on the cognitive processing of particular terms because they already know the meaning, right? So, so all I'm saying here is that there are exciting new discoveries to be made and in all sorts of fields um, and subfields, eye tracking can provide some depth to the inferences and to the conclusions that we can make as researchers. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please fire away. Oh, thanks, Valentina. <laughs> it was too Bravo. fast. <laughs> no, no, but it was, in a, it was in a perfect time. Perfect time. And you show us, probably for all of us, new things. My colleagues were talking to me about it, that this type of theory 
is common in other universities in Chile. Uh, for example, in, in, in Valparaíso, it's super common, but about the process of learning languages, but not about subtitles and, and this kind of things. Uh, probably someone um, um, has a, a question to Valentina, but let me tell you one thing, because in my experience, I don't know the experience in Italy, but the experience in Chile above all in all times, when I was a, a child, was, for example, films in cinemas or some programs in television, but above all films in cinema, uh, usually were with subtitles. For example, in Spain, it's not common. Yes, I want to ask you, in fact, is Chile, because I think Spain is a dubbing country like Italy, too okay because but, in, in in spain it's a big business about dubbing yes. you can study you can study about yes, or usually cool. actors and actresses do that no in latin america sometimes when, uh, yeah. oh yes it's a culture and i remember when i learned to uh, to read i was six 1983 i remember perfectly and my dad brought to me to the cinema and we watched uh, superman three and the return of the Jedi. I remember my first time with films for uh, big people, old people. Super, I was six. Adults, so, and you're, 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 you know, <laughs> no, he let, let you join the club for a yeah, bit. I was super time. proud with my dad in the cinema with this type of films, uh, science fiction with him. I, I remember, uh, oh, I knew that my dad loved this type of films. My poor dad, he told me, Sole, you must to read. But at the same time, you must to watch the screen. It could be quite hard for you. So if you have a question, please ask me. But I remember that experience because probably I, I, I tell to you this, this moment because I talk about that for many years about all with friends in Spain about this type of experience because my friends in Spain didn't live this type of situation when they were children. Usually when you go to to the cinema when you are in the university and you watch a Chinese or Japanese or Russian film, a specific film, African, um, I don't know, Indian film in Irani or Pakistani or Russian or Chinese or Japanese language. Okay, they have the first experience and for them it's super difficult. No, I can't, I couldn't watch that film because it was super difficult for me, but we grow up with this kind of situation. So it could be a good experience to study children from Latin America in this type of process and people, for example, adults, young adults in, in, in their yeah, 20s. Yeah, compare maybe, right? Yes. And compare perhaps, yes, yes. Yeah. I would, uh, and actually it's funny that you say that because my colleagues, so it's, I showed you only some pictures of the audiovisual transition lab in Warsaw, but there's actually partners that we have in Australia, the study they were replicating and some in the UK as well. And at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, there is a, a, a researcher called Sharon Black, who is collaborating with us. I'm just going to put uh, her name in the chat. And she has recently, oh, well, I don't know how recent it was now, but um, published, uh, and she's one of the few people who is publishing with children. So eye tracking in children. This has particular challenges because, you know, you can't just, depending on how young or old the child is, but, uh, you know, maybe a young teenager, you can, you, can, you can do that. And I think she tested nine to 12 year olds, but which is only quite old. So, but working with younger populations is going to be a little bit harder because you have to do other things. The calibration cannot be the nine point calibrations because they don't pay too much attention. So there are some challenges, but I completely agree with you. It would be very interesting to study participants who like viewers who are young and so really quite plastic in terms of uh, in terms of brain development. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we know also from second language acquisition that there is something called the critical period hypothesis, and there's lots of people disagreeing on when this, this critical period is, but there is a general overall agreement that up until a certain age, if you learn a second language, you can learn as a native speaker, right? So if we give, so especially in a situation which, for example, I'm Italian, I grew up in Italy, my mom is Italian, my brother is Italian, my, my father is Italian, we're all Italian. So for me to learn English back then in a country that is dubbing, the only items the only the only exposure that i had was in the classroom right so 
maybe we could provide subtitles, about f- subtitle film in other languages, even to children from a relative young age. And this might help somehow help them later in life when, when they get to school at six, seven, eight, maybe in, in Italy, I started learning English at, at seven or eight. So not, in, not at the beginning of elementary school, but after a couple of years. And then we continue until 18. Italian is proverbially bad as, 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 as a system for teaching foreign languages. But I, I believe that if we integrated that, it would be useful. And what proves that to me is the fact that you still remember it, right? Mm-hmm. It's an experience that you still remember because we learn better through holistic sort of under non subliminal channels, if you like, when we're having fun, for example, you tend to learn and, and assimilate information in, when, when we don't have this anxiety related to performance, relating to school and all this kind of thing. So, and films, you know, are something that we can use in the lab, but people, people typically use at home, right? So it's in a comfortable environment and, you know, of course, not when they're strapped into the contraption, the chin the rest that I showed you <laughs> earlier, but I, I completely agree. But if we can prove that there is a benefit in using them, then, you know, perhaps we can change school syllabus, uh, the syllabuses, or we can uh, suggest it to young mothers or to, to moms in general to, to use with our young children. So, uh, yes, I completely agree with you. Thank you for raising that. You're welcome. Alejandra has a question. Yes, thank you uh, very much. Super exciting, Valentina. I, I knew I knew this was going to be a, a really good um, conference. Um, no, I'm, I learned a lot, like I imagine a lot of us have. Um, I was just wondering, and it's things that, well, you were just discussing in a way, I was wondering about context, if that, because you did mention it in a way, but yes, I understand that yeah, strapping the person, you know, and looking at the machine is, is one kind of experience, whereas watching at home or in a classroom yes. is another kind of experience, as well as age, as well as your environment, your family life, where you live, etc. I imagine that those are things that you may consider as important. And, and linked to that, I was thinking, for example, someone who's watching at home and can rewind a scene, for example, and can look again at certain subtitles, if, if those are like scenarios that you have considered, I imagine, as, as variables. Yes, I mean, we try to stay as far as, but we try to really control for it in the lab. That's what we try to do so that we don't have to consider that because the moment you start broadening the picture, then potentially everything matters, right? In a way, and context is, is certainly very important. And, you know, who knows if, if even... You know, I have my doubts that what will you find in a lab when someone is sat like this and there is the experimenter. I mean, you've seen how small the room is. You're sat right next to them. I mean, it's surprising how much people get immersed, right? And don't mm. forget about the experimenter, the eye tracking machines, and they just get taken by the video. But, mm. you know, it makes you wonder. It's different from a situation in which you're at home, slouching, you know, maybe maybe whilst you eat, maybe you have mm. full sleep. So there, it, it's, it's, it's context is certainly matters. Uh, uh, and I would say massively so. As... For your point about rewinding, very good point also, right? I, I Generally, what we do is we try to see, okay, if there is a benefit after one single exposure uh, mm-hmm. where the participants were unable to rewind, then that's a pretty good indication that the moment you can mm-hmm. rewind, the moment you can, you know, you do it at your own pace, maybe slow down, then it will be even better. So that's mm-hmm. the assumption. But uh, yes, I mean, I don't know of actually any studies where they allowed where they gave the full control, so the remote control, mm-hmm. for example, to the to the participant, mm-hmm. perhaps with that, that would be a really interesting study. Okay, mm-hmm. what? So if I show the same clip to a number mm-hmm. of participants, to, to some participants that uh, don't have any power whatsoever on mm-hmm. on the presentation uh, speed of the subtitles, versus some people who cannot change the speed at which they are presented, but can mm-hmm. pause the video and rewind. Mm-hmm. I expect. Then in terms of comprehension, for example, this would uh, would have huge consequences, right? It means mm-hmm. that anything that you can't understand, you can all of a sudden go back and check. And the important thing is that, you know, sometimes what people don't understand or have issues with is different. It changes from person to person mm-hmm. because we read the different books, we have mm-hmm. gone through different classes, we have different language proficiency. So especially as a language learner, even if we are in the same class and technically at the same mm-hmm. level, what is very difficult for you might not be particularly difficult for me and vice versa, mm. right? So this mm. ability of 
the rewinding when I found something that is there is hard and I wanted to disambiguate, I think that would be quite important. So I've made a note of that. Maybe we'll run a study in the future with this. <laughs> Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. More questions, a... more questions. Yes, there is a, a question by Julia in the chat. I was wondering if eye tracking can help us ma make more user-friendly subtitles, not just when it comes to reading speeds, but also if it's better to have pyramid-shaped subtitles, two lines or one line, segmentation, etc. Also, if it's better to use cognates or translate quickly. Okay, okay, on the cognates, I could speak for about two hours, so maybe we should have a one-to-one -one session because... In my PhD, and now in the studies that we're running, we are also applying for more funding to do a study entirely on cognates. I think this has a huge impact, of course. You know, we want to look at cognates with Italian, Polish, and German. Uh, so you can see, you know, how the third, our cognates that are, that exist in three languages can influence. So yes, absolutely. And I, but I don't know if I would phrase it as it's better to use cognates or translate freely. Um, so in my PhD, I looked at this literal translation, right? So, so and by literal, I mean orthographic similarity as much as possible. So, for example, the word trasparente in Italian and transparent in English. But you could also translate transparente as see-through, right? So this would be two cases, one of which is uh, orthographically very similar and one of which is orthographically very distant. So... so and they are also cognates, right? And they're cognates with the same semantic meaning because transparent and transparent, more or less, they might have some, that there is a vast overlap in, in, uh, in semantic areas of use, right? Versus something like see-through. Um, and so if you, if you translate freely and you change a little bit the meaning as well, right? So you, you, you end up in some sort of incongruency or you use um, words that are really infrequent, um, so, for example, prophecy uh, in Italian can be translated as profezia, right, which is a bit different, but, but it's, it's very, you know, the root is the same and it's only the end of the word that changes. You could calculate something called Levenstein difference and get this um, number of, of, of characters, similarity between the two versus vaticinio. Now, vaticinio is a very, uh, a very low frequency Italian word. And, you know, I've seen in my PhD, I, I tested this word and, I, you know, the assumption is was initially that smoother processing in terms of eye movements will, it will be obtained when you have something like prophecy prophecy. Okay, great. But then, so, and then I, I tested two things in my PhD. Um, the recognition memory. So I, I, I gave them the, so what was said in this subtitle? Prophecia, uh, vaticinio or something else, right? And when people saw it in the literal condition, so prophecy prophecy, they generally obtained better recognition memory. But then I also had this other part with the, in which I just asked them, what were the words that you remember um, from the clip, right? Just open question. And I'm so glad I did because they just came up with lots of words that, you know, after a single exposure, unlikely to know these words. You know, maybe if they are highly educated, they might know vaticination, which is an English word. But you know, and, and most of the people in the in the recognition test, so that this literal, uh, more cognate style translation was was better recognized. But in the free recall, where I don't pro try to prompt anything, I just ask them, "What did you? What picked your interest more?" All of they picked. Well, most of the words they picked were were non literally. So, where if you want to translate it freely, as as you say there, right? So. I don't know what is better to use because it depends on what is better for what, right? For recognition memory or for, so because you could argue and then I, I looked for some psychology theories that would help me explain these differences. And so there's something called the depth of processing, but maybe, you know, you, you yes, you remember more because, because it's more similar, but you also process more shallowly, right? Whereas something that is so different, you might make more regressions. I couldn't look at regressions and I couldn't look at the words because I had one single box around the subtitle, right? Now I would be able to do this. Um, and, I, and we will be doing this. Um, and now, so when you have something that attracts your attention a lot and maybe disrupts your expectations, that's another thing that I found is the expectations. A lot of the people said, why? Oh, I, I like this word. I, I remember this word because I wouldn't have expected it or because um, it was very distant from the original. I mean, these were quite advanced learners of Italian. Um, so you could argue that also that influence, you know, they are able to, they have a very specific set of expectations. And the moment you go away from the expectation, they will notice. So there's another noticing theory. So 
Um, so as the cognates and, and the free translation there, which is extremely interesting, thank, for your, thank you very much for your question. As to the pyramid shape subtitles, two lines and one line, I can refer you to some work that my uh, that the head of my uh, lab, uh, Dr. Uh, Agnieszka Szarkowska, has done in the past. So, and which I don't remember what the results were right now, but they, she investigated one-liners and two-liners. In terms of, which are the standards, right? Generally, we can have up to three lines, but we don't really see three lines and they start, you start covering portions of the screen. So, there, you know, when it comes to subtitles, there are some both temporal and spatial specific constraints, the specific constraints of time. So the subtitle needs to appear, but also disappear. It needs to stay on screen for long enough for you to read it. And now we, we know that, you know, it's, it's, uh, they're trying to fit more words within the same uh, subtitles, so the speed increases and also spatial, right? No more than whatever, however many characters per line and no more than two lines. So you, we are working within these constraints. Now, whether it's better to have two lines or one liners, I mean, I cannot tell you, but what I can tell you is that eye tracking would be the perfect methodology to look into this, right? So if you look at disruptions or, or the number of regressions, my hunch would be that if we have only one-liners, you know, the sentences will be more bitty. It will be just one, one, one flash, one flash. Whereas sometimes when you have two lines, you can fit an entire sentence in a subtitle. So the processing could be more complete. I mean, I am speculating to some extent here, so don't take my word for it. Hope we're not... Are we still recording? Probably yes. <laughs> Maybe we can stop recording. Okay. Um, <laughs> Dear Valentina, oh, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. A, a little last question, because probably anything else uh, has a question. Uh, I was thinking, for example, in my case, I'm, 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 I'm super bad in second languages. So in my opinion, even my, my, my first language, I learning every day. So, for example, when I watch a film or a series in English, I use the subtitle in English, like a, 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 a tool. No, I, I say I put a name. It's the little wheel of the bicycle. Of the bicycle, when you're learning bicycle, so you use little little wheels. It's the same. So probably when you are better or you are getting better in 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 a second language, probably you read more faster, or you only need a word, no, only a word of the line of the subtitle. It could be a good idea too for le learning a, a second language. Yes, of course, I would, uh, I would agree with you. The more proficient you are, probably the faster you read. Um, and I've never, because I, it's really quite hard to find really um, uh, proficient uh, participants who are English native speakers learning Italian. So I think I should, if I wanted to ever do this, I would go have to go back to Italy. And then in Italy, everyone learns English and then you could pick different proficiencies, right? And then maybe compare. But certainly this is something that uh, is worth investigating. And I think that there is already mounting evidence that says that this, this, um, the, this variable certainly influences reading patterns, you may be quicker. And actually it's interesting that you, 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 you said, you mentioned keywords, right? There is someone else that has done some interesting research on keyword captioning. So English to English, um, where only certain words were, were, uh, were subtitled, right? So it has been investigated. I personally still think that, I don't know what would be the utility of that. Uh, I mean, mm. it would be to highlight certain words, okay, via this, this keyword. So you, 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 you only present certain keywords in the subtitle, so they are automatically enhanced, uh, highlighted, right? Um, but I suspect that in those instances, if you had the video and you had the images, those would be the, the channels that you use to complement the information that is missing from the subtitles, right? Um, if we try to do keyword captioning in our experiment with no sound and with, with sometimes no video, then I think they said that this would disrupt comprehension and, and understanding to, 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 some, to the extent that it's unusable and becomes sort of pointless, right? But, uh, but it could be used in other situations for sure. Okay. Sometimes, for example, we have problems with our own language, Spanish. Sometimes some films in, 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 in Spanish from Spain, I don't know if the quality for us is super difficult. So sometimes I can put subtitles in my own language in spanish for series That's from so spain interesting. you know we also we also do this have you ever seen gomorra for example <laughs> wow 
Gomorra in the, the, the film Gomorra by Roberto yeah. Soriano, it, you know, it, we, we, I need subtitles in Italian because it's a different languages in the Naples local dialect, oh, yeah. very oh, yeah. far from Italian. So, yes, so, exa- so in the same way that, that Kotari, this, this Indian uh, um, uh, scholar, investigated literacy, I mean, not for literacy purposes in our, in our case, but even same language subtitles certainly have... Uh, a lot of applications, you know, and, and this has happened, happened even in a dubbing country like Italy, right? Because we really needed the subtitles for that particular, uh, for that. Oh, sometimes um, Montalbano, a very famous series that was shown on the BBC now that the, these thrillers are becoming more and more popular, yeah. uh, tends to have subtitles. Uh, and uh, when I watch, when I, the, the few sort of excerpts that I watch, I also sometimes, I tried without, but sometimes, what are they saying? You know, I'm from the Northeast near Venice. It's very far from Sicily and potentially very different uh, linguistically, linguistically as well. So absolutely, yes. Okay. Any more questions or we are finishing because, ah, Hime, our part Just of our comment. <laughs> Congratulations oh. on your presentation. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I had to leave for a couple of minutes, but then I'm back. I was thinking about Sol's comment concerning um, your own native language. For me, it's very useful to activate subtitles when I'm watching a Spanish movie, you know, because it's sometimes it's so hard to understand what they're saying in terms of pronunciation first, and then lexical knowledge. And that is one aspect that maybe should be researched deeply with native speakers as well as with second language learners, because sometimes the subtitles uh, belong or are written in a special variety of Spanish. And imagine you live in Chile, and there you have the variety of Spanish from Spain. So you don't understand. So the processing takes longer, and you have to go back again. And even for us that are native speakers of Spanish, right? Yesterday I was watching a movie, and I said, what did they say? Let's go back. Rewind it. Ah, then the subtitles. But I didn't understand the subtitles either. So, so that's interesting. I mean, what I'm thinking here is that there's something called localization, right? So within the same with, within the same sort of language, which is very broad, and it's, it's, Spanish is a perfect example. English is also a very good example of this. Depending on where you go, South Africa, Canada, United States of America, Australia, New Zealand, England, Scotland, Wales, um, you, you know, you may find pretty different um, ways of expressing the same concept. Sometimes, as you mentioned yourself, lexical as well, right? Mm-hmm. So absolutely. What I'm thinking here, though, that if, if maybe the producers of, the, of these films or, or the distributors were a bit lazy and they didn't localize the content, so they're like, okay, translation is into Spanish, great. Or there is such, a, and then that's it, when actually, in fact, who's, who's Spanish and, and, and Spanish and where from, right? There is also something, can I ask you all a question? There is uh, sometimes this... Um, international Spanish variety that we, so I, I also worked in the past when I was at Bristol with these CAT tools, with this computer assisted translation, nothing to do with the audiovisuals. I'm very glad I'm working on both the audiovisuals again now. But, you know, when you create and set up a project to then provide to, to, to the translator to, to work with, with the glossaries and everything you can choose. And there's always this international variety of Spanish. What do you think about it in, in films, uh, subtitles or otherwise? Is this something that is useful for, for because, I don't understand really what, what, what it means, right? I assume that it will have some Spanish and maybe some Latin American terms and some other, but or some Mexican terms. Like, but, but, what do you think of this um, of this variety of the? Of there are two style? types of international. In fact, oh is the international Spanish from Spain and international Spanish from Latin America. This is a reality, and some linguists try to make uh, other division in Hispanoamerica itself, but probably it's not necessary. We prove that, for example, with the Simpsons. Simpsons uh, have the, um, has the, the international Latin American Spanish uh, dubbing in Mexico. They're Mexican uh, uh, dubbings. So sometimes you can find some detail, but it's only details. And for example, right now, Right now, in this moment, in the last two months, I'm watching a soup opera from Turkey. <laughs> it's my first 
Turkey soup opera in all my life. They are very popular in the last 10 years. In, no, we were just in, in talking Chile. about this with my colleague from uh, from Colombia the other day. He gave a presentation. He said exactly this. Yeah. It's, uh, they tend to be very popular in uh, in Asia as well, which oh, is completely no, yeah. It's a phenomenon, phenomenon. And a big crisis for the people who work in soup operas in, in Chile itself because all the people <laughs> were common, watching right? Turkish uh, soup operas. So they have to... Um, international Spanish uh, from Hispan America uh, dubbing. And it's okay. It's the same. Uh, we have, for example, some channels uh, in, in, in the television, in the private television. For example, we have History Channel and History Channel has the same. So probably not in my case. I didn't grow up with this type of international Spanish. But But by the way, when I was a teenager, 13, 14, I started to watch this type of television with this type of channels and you start to live with that. Usually. It's, it's, so it's you mean that a... you get uh, used to it, to this international variety? And I assume that maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, I assume that it, it's not as disruptive as watching in a totally different language. Really, you will understand what, 80%, 90%, probably maybe even more. Maybe just probably like the one, old word that's that probably one hundred percent because okay. usually they use um, a standard Spanish, but it's the brand of the person too. For example, in my case, I study literature, linguistic. So probably we can make a, a a test with with a common people, not people who study a linguistic and literature. Yeah, yeah, but. We usually understand all 100%, I suppose, I suppose. And then there are just these odd words which catch your attention because they're a bit unusual or you wouldn't use that word in your local variety of Spanish. Is that, is that sort of what's going yeah, on? Yeah, sometimes it's, some words uh, can be in a low um, range of use, but it's not strange for us because some linguists uh, say no this is super strange this is a artificial type but in fact probably not I was thinking about that yesterday watching my super opera but because I thought oh this is international a lot of linguists criticize this type of um, neutral or international um, type of language but probably because and, and I, I thought this last night Washing dishes, watching my my Turkish soup opera is because probably we grow up with this type of language, with the Simpsons, with the television, with this. So type you're of sort of uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. So you're sort of more uh, accustomed to it, acclimatized to it, compared to someone who's. So so you think that maybe someone from Spain, from Spanish, from Spain, if 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 encountering, you know, the international variety from South America, they might have more resistance or. Probably yes, probably yes, because this is from Spain. But for example, with some books, in the translation with some books, for example, it's a famous publisher who translate uh, from the English uh, uh, popular books of the um, beat generation. For example, Kerouac, above yes. all, uh, or not beat generation itself, but uh, the books of, uh, from Bukowski. But this is a publisher from Spain. And usually this type of writers use a super colloquial way of English. So the translators put in a colloquial uh, Spanish ah, from Spain. And that's the changes, right, arise, because probably colloquialism in South America might be very different from a But colloquialism. Every in... country, every country, yeah, each yeah. country has a special colloquial way. So the point is, uh, because we didn't have the chance to have um, a, a local publisher Chilean, or okay, by the way, Mexican, Argentinian. We read this type of books mm -hmm. with a Spanish from Spain colloquial way, but it, for us probably it's quite uh, noisy in some ways, oh, but at the same time, it's, we don't have other way. We don't have other chance. I don't know that the rest of the, of the group uh, mm -hmm. thinks about that. Yes, I think this is a great example, actually, this, the, the fact mm -hmm. that colloquialism tends to be where mm -hmm. one of the lo lo locus uh, or lo locuses, lo lo child, locky, <laughs> of, yeah. uh, of, um, 
of differences, right? Well, between between even the varieties. Um, and someone was mentioning uh, again what you said about neutral. I can see in the chat or the conosur Spanish. TV used to translate into conosur Spanish. And what what is this? Is this one of the, the variety from South America, the international variety for South America? Oh, probably I didn't know. Julia I says know. I probably know. yes. It's a special uh, yes. Yeah, in Paraguay and Uruguay. Okay, okay. Okay, but not Mexico. Because like my sister-in-law, yeah. my brother's married a Mexican uh, woman, so we have bilingual children. I mean, not we. I don't. They have. <laughs> but uh, and uh, and they uh, and and you know and I I and she sometimes when we speak, she she has told me that uh, the Mexican variety is quite peculiar, right? And I, I heard from other sources that. Many people, especially in Spain, make fun of the Mexican variety. I don't know if this is really true, but uh, the Mexican variety is, 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 is one of the varieties that is made fun of more, most often. Don't ask me why, and this could be totally um, apocryphal and, and uh, totally false. Um, but, but, oh, and then someone also is mentioning Spanglish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would say a bit of a different, like that's a bit of a different, uh, different type issue yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it's other thing completely different yeah oh it's the argentinian variety that is usually made fun of okay mm-hmm. okay in many countries okay so maybe i got that wrong so okay i will have to remember that and uh, when i talk to her next thank you actually no 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 but but there is a the mexican stereotype yeah. Definitely. Okay. I mean, maybe, so yeah. The, 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 so the Argentinian maybe. variety of the language is, is made of all, but there is definitely a Mexican stereotype. Okay. So the two Definitely. Two yeah. Was... And sure. And for us, it's very different and it calls our attention that pronunciation, certain terminology. I would say definitely. If you get a, if you get a film which is dubbed in Mexican, for us, it's, it's strange. It's even interesting, right? It's not. Yeah like normal yes. I don't know, yeah, yeah. linked to our reality you would expect yeah. yeah excellent thank you for teaching me something about, uh, about <laughs> Spanish the many <laughs> lives of, of the Spanish this sort of umbrella term that, that you know takes oh it's big it's huge yes yes, yes. <laughs> many areas who have many areas that the dialectology in 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 in, in Spanish language is a big topic yeah. until nowadays but by the way, if you need some information about that, we are here uh, <laughs> in Thank the you. faculty. We have a special type of, uh, of Spanish, even in the dialectology. Usually the dialectology divide the Spanish in, in, in Hispan America for uh, places, zones. Rio Platense, Guaranitica, Andina, Mesoamericana, Caribe. But Chile exists like a zone itself. Is the only one who has the name of the country because we have a special type of variety with sounds, phonology, above all, uh, isolate. Okay. So, so there is an overlap between the current political uh, boundaries of the of the of the country today and these areas that are sort of di- dialectology related, uh, these territorial areas from maybe from from previously also yeah yeah because it's an isolate uh, because the cordillera de los andes pacific ocean was super difficult to arrive to chile in in in, in the colonial times super difficult so usually isolate places develop a special type of language no a special type of variety I remember being in Patagonia and spending one even one Christmas 30 kilometers from the border with Chile. So I was wow. in, I was but in Argentina, Argentina. <laughs> in Ushuaia. In Argentina, but I was yes, no, 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 not as far down at South as Ushuaia. Mm. It was Perito Moreno. It was so oh, we, were, okay. we were on en route and we were the closest that we got to the Chilean border was 30 kilometers. That's all I can that's as close as I've been. Um, <laughs> are there any more questions, anyone? Sorry, I don't want to get down. We're not we're not talking about subtitles anymore. It looks like maybe no. No, but we are super happy, Valentina. Thank because you. we learn I a lot. It. No, we learn a lot. And uh, for us, it's a beautiful um, um, moment to start with you this seminar, no, with this topic, with these problems, with this research. Uh, and I don't know if someone wants to tell. Uh, 
a farewell <laughs> uh, word for Valentina. Probably Ale, probably Jime. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I mean, as uh, Sole said, this is like a more, I don't know, scientific or technical way of, of beginning the seminar, but it's super fascinating for, for people like me who, who are working, you know, from a, in a different dimension of yes, translation, absolutely. but it, it's super interesting to see what's being done today. I mean, all, all those fields and how fascinating and highlighting, you know, the importance and the relevance of, yeah. of so translation. Yeah, I hope it was, uh, it was clear and it wasn't too technical despite the graphs. I just no, myself super into clear. Graphs. Okay, <laughs> yeah. No, thank, yeah. thank you very much on your presentation, Valentina. It was very educational. We've learned a lot. Some of us knew a little bit about um, eye tracking technology that is really useful in reading comp also. Um, and uh, it was really, you know, in some cases, uh, eye opening and eye opening presentation for us. Great. So fun. thank you. Thank you very much Great for your presentation right there. again. Okay. <laughs> and uh, if you, uh, I mean, I, I can, I've already sent the, the slides to, to Soledad. Yeah, that would be great. Any mistakes or something like this, I corrected. So I will send them to you again and maybe give them a one last check. And, uh, but yes, I'm more than happy to share. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop us a line. Um, I'll put my email in the chat now. <laughs> just in case and it's also on the slides anyway perfect perfect thanks for everything so don't forget the next presentation will be june the 17th at midday chilean time with alejandra of course Yay! so we will change the time we will change the, the the methodology we will change the point of view and we will see uh, traductions about uh, Libros de Caballería. Where, where is the translation? Oh. A knife books, probably. Cavalry, cavalry books or something like that. Chivalric romance. Yeah. Good. Chivalric romance. Yeah. Love <laughs> so it. That's, that's a difficult <laughs> translation. It's a difficult translation. Yeah. <laughs> but we will learn. We will learn. So we will see in two weeks more, guys. So thanks for everything. Uh, Valentina, let's get in contact if you need some information about the Spanish language. We are here and you're completely welcome to Chile if you want. So thank you. We'll, we'll try to look for uh, maybe some conference taking place in South America at some point. And if it's possible, we will. Oh, uh... You're completely welcome here. You're completely welcome. So let's get in, in contact. Okay. We will. Thank you very much for everything. Everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>